Mathematical preliminaries. In this video, we're going to talk about phasers, how to do math with phasers, and we'll end with a quick discussion of scalars and vectors. Let's talk about phasers. Anytime we're using phasers, we're talking about functions that are oscillating harmonically. That means they're following a sine or cosine. So I've defined just a function here, y of t. It's so function y varying as a function of t, and I'm writing it as an amplitude times a cosine. And inside that cosine, there's a frequency omega multiplying time plus a phase. There's a really strange identity, if you have not seen this before, Euler's identity. And what it's doing, it's relating a complex exponential, right? There's this J up here, and in electrical engineering, we use J for the square root of negative one instead of I. And that bothers a lot of people, but doesn't seem to bother us electrical engineers. But complex exponentials are essentially trig functions, are sines and cosines, cosine theta plus J sine theta. So given that Euler's identity, and given that we have a function that is some amplitude multiplying a cosine, and if we think of this first cosine in Euler's identity as the cosine of our function, that lets us write our function y of t slightly differently. We can say that y of t is the real part of a complex exponential. And what is the complex exponential? It's a times e to the j, and then in parentheses here, so those were the arguments inside of our cosine. The last thing we'll do here is just expand this complex exponential so we have an e to the j omega t and then e to the j theta. And the reason we're doing that is we'll end up just dropping this term because frequency never changes as long as we're analyzing something that is linear. So we start where we ended on the last slide. And when we are employing phasers, we are almost always analyzing things that are linear. And certainly in this class, everything we'll analyze is linear. And so frequency never changes in a linear system. That means if I am doing calculations, I don't need to constantly carry this through my calculations because I know ahead of time it's never going to change. It's always, always just going to be e to the j omega t. So when we write phasers, we tend to get lazy and not even bothering write this e to the j omega t. And even more, a lot of times we don't even bother writing this real operation on the outside, and both of those things are just implied. So in the end, given some function y of t, that is a times cosine omega t plus theta, in phasor form, we would just write it this way. I am using a capital Y to remember that this is a phasor and not, not really the original function. And we just say a times e to the j theta, where this theta is the phase, and we're not writing the real operation, and we're not writing the e to the j omega t. So this is the phasor representing our cosine function. Here is the classic way to visualize what a phasor is representing. So on the left, I've written our original function and how we're writing it in phasor form. So this animation on the right at the top is our original function. I am plotting y of t as a function of time and it's oscillating harmonically. And so y of t is really just wiggling back and forth along this axis and upward. I'm just tracking what that value of y was at previous times. And so to us, that looks like a wave. Now we need to remember this y of t along this axis is blue dot. This is the only thing really that physically exists. And it's just harmonically going back and forth. With a phaser, we're going to add information to this. And we're going to think of this rather than just a single point going back and forth, we're going to think of this as a vector that is spinning along a circle. And the radius of this circle or the length of that vector will be A. That's the original magnitude of our phaser. 
and it's spinning along this circle. And if we were to look at the horizontal position of the point of where the vector reaches the circle, the horizontal position is our original y function. But there's also now the vertical position. And that's what I meant when I said we have added information here to come up with a phaser. A phaser contains more information than the original function. And that is artificial information. It is fake information. And it's been added to make our calculations much easier. Uh, they're much easier when we're analyzing things oscillating harmonically. A phaser can be written one of two ways. And so we'll call this the rectangular form or the polar form. Now the polar form has a magnitude and it has an angle. One notation, we can write it as the amplitude and then e to the j theta. This is a little bit more mathematically rigorous. However, I think you can also write it as an amplitude and just remember this theta is the angle and write it that way. Sometimes that's more convenient as well. So that's the polar form. We have an amplitude or a radius, if you will, and the angle. So if we have a point somewhere and our phaser y, the amplitude is the distance from the origin and then the angle theta is the rotation off of the positive real axis. We could write the same thing in rectangular form where we have a real part and an imaginary part multiplying this j. And we can see how these are related. We have the same point y, its distance along the real axis is alpha and its distance away from the origin along the imaginary axis is beta. Now, when we are adding or subtracting phasers, we prefer the rectangular form because adding and subtracting is very easy. If we're multiplying or dividing phasers, we like the polar form because that makes multiplication and division really easily. So when we have calculations involving multiplications, divisions, additions, and subtractions, we're constantly converting back and forth between polar and rectangular form. And if you have this program into your calculator, and a lot of times calculators can handle complex numbers and all this is happening automatically, but if not, program that into your calculator because you'll be going back and forth just depending whether you're multiplying, dividing, adding, or subtracting. If we wanna go from rectangular form to polar form, so rectangular form, that means we have the real and an imaginary part. Calculating the magnitude, it's easy. That's just Pythagorean theorem. That's just the square root of alpha squared plus beta squared, or the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. The angle is a bit more difficult. We think we'd like to write just the arc tangent here. However, the arc tangent has some problems in that it's limited in the angles that it calculates. And so we really have to go to this two argument arc tangent to calculate the angle. We'll talk about that on the next slide. If we want to go from polar to rectangular, that's the easiest. Uh, the real part of the phaser is the magnitude times cosine of the angle, and the imaginary part of the phaser is the amplitude times the sine of the angle. Now let's talk about this two argument arc tangent. Well, what's the problem with the ordinary arc tangent? Well, it is limited from minus pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. That means in the complex plane, we're ignoring the entire left half. Well, what if our phaser is on the left half of this plane? Well, we would calculate incorrect angles if we were to use the ordinary arc tangent. Now, the two argument tangent, unfortunately, is not very easy or not that easy, but here's the basic recipe to do that. If we're on the right-hand side of the plane, then we can use the ordinary arc tangent. If we're at the left side of the plane, what's highlighted in red here, we have to add or subtract pi to put us in the, the range of angle minus pi to positive pi, and that's how we would choose the sign. Or we could look at our beta, and if the beta is greater than or equal to zero, in other words, if we're on the top of the complex plane, then we would know to add pi. If our beta is negative, we are on the bottom of the complex plane, then we would know to subtract pi. And of course, if alpha is zero, we only have a beta, that means we're along this vertical axis, so our angle has to be pi over two, but how do you choose the sign? Well, you choose the sign 
consistent with the sign of beta. And then, of course, if alpha is zero and beta is zero, that is undefined. We can't calculate an angle from that. So the two argument arctan remains undefined, just like the arctangent. And so the range of the two argument tan is from minus pi to pi. That covers the entire complex plane, whereas the ordinary arctangent does not. So this is how you'll have to do your calculations in your calculators. This is built in. If not, I would recommend programming that in. So phasor arithmetic, as I mentioned before, addition and subtraction, we will use the phasors in rectangular form. So if F is a phasor, so we have two phasors now, how do we add that? Well, the real part of the sum is the sum of the real parts of the individual phasors. And the imaginary part of the sum is the sum of the imaginary parts of the original two phasors. Subtraction is almost the exact same thing. The real part of the difference is the difference of the real part of the individual phasers or the original phasers. And the imaginary part is the difference between the imaginary parts of the original phasers. That's pretty easy to do. Multiplication. Now we're going to be using the phasers in polar form. So if we're multiplying two phasers, that gives us an amplitude and a phase of the product. And the magnitude of the product is simply the product of the magnitudes of the original two phasers. And the angle of the product is the sum of the angles of the original phasers. Division again, we're going to be using the polar form. And the amplitude or the magnitude of the Divided phasor is simply the dividing of the uh, original amplitudes of the original two phasors. And here the angle is the difference of the angles. So for multiplication, it was a sum. Division, it's now a difference. And if you have a calculator that can handle complex numbers, you may not even have to jump back and forth between polar and rectangular. You can just do addition and subtraction. But this is actually what's happening inside of the calculator, addition and subtraction is happening with the phaser in rectangular form and multiplication and division is happening with the phasers in polar form. On to scalars and vectors. Scalar numbers are just a single number. It's a single piece of information. Sometimes we'll call it magnitude, maybe even amplitude. Now scalars can be real or complex numbers and phasors we're interpreting as scalar quantities. Vectors are sort of like two pieces of information at the same time. They'll have a magnitude, so they have a scalar piece of information, but they also have a direction. So for example, if you're driving down the highway, you have a speed, you also have a direction. Maybe you're driving 100 kilometers per second and you're traveling north. That's both a magnitude and a direction. In electromagnetics, our fields will have a strength or a magnitude, and they'll also be pointing in a direction. That's true for both electric and magnetic fields. Now let's talk a bit about vector notation. So here I'm drawing a vector. And really this vector is associated with something happening at a single point. But since I need to convey direction and amplitude, I have to draw something that extends away from that point. And usually the length of the arrow will convey the magnitude of the vector and the direction conveys direction, obviously. Now with this notation, I can really only see directions that are in the plane of the paper. What if the direction is in and out of the paper or in and out of the screen here? Well, here's a notation we use. If we draw a circle with a dot in it, that is a vector coming, coming from the screen straight toward our face. And in the opposite direction, we'd have a circle with a cross in it. That is a vector pointing away from our face through the screen. And it's kind of like you're looking at an arrow, you know, shot from a bow. If it's coming at you, you're looking at the point. And if it's going away, you're looking at the, the feathers or the fins in the back. 
Now, one thing I want to point out here that tends to be confusing, whenever we draw vectors, this is something associated with a single point, but we have to draw it extending away. But don't confuse this. This vector has nothing to do with what's happening over here. It's only what's happening at this single infinitely small point. And it, it's very easy to confuse to say, okay, well, whatever's happening here is going to smear over to whatever's there. And while that may be happening, the vector itself is not implying that. It's just, we have to draw it. Um, you know, really we should draw this infinitely small. So we have this little tiny arrow on top of that point. That'd be a more accurate way to do it. But of course, then we could not see the arrow. So don't think just because the vector points away from that point that we're actually talking about anything happening over here. We're, we're talking about something happening at this single point. Here's a way you can visualize this, this inwards and outwards thing. So let's say this is your head and your face and you see on paper here the circle with the cross in it. We're talking about a vector pointing away from your face like you're looking at the fins at the back of an arrow. And if you see the circle with a point in it, you're looking at a vector co coming toward your face like you're looking at the tip of an arrow. So now you know what that notation means and how to visualize it. So when we're given a vector, what are the different things that it can convey? Well, one is position. And when a vector represents position, it's always relative to somewhere else. And typically that is going to be the origin, zero, zero, zero. And so a vector would extend away from the origin and point to a single point. So we would call that vector position. It can convey a distance, a distance and a direction. So we would have a starting point and an ending point and the vector connecting these two things shows you the distance between those points and also the direction to go from one to the other. Vectors can also represent some kind of disturbance and disturbance is just a word I use to come up with that it's, it's measuring something happening at a single point. So it might be an electric field at this point that has some amplitude and some direction. Maybe there's a magnetic field over here pointing in a certain direction and the length would convey its strength. Maybe we're looking at the velocity of water vapor particles in a cloud. And if you ever look up at clouds, they move slowly. If you're in the cloud, they move a little bit more quickly. And maybe this is a little water droplet that's moving at a certain velocity in this direction. Over here, maybe another water droplet. It may be a pressure so that the pressure has a strength and a direction that it's pushing. So any kind of disturbance we can really describe as a vector quantity. In electromagnetics, these vectors will be our electric and magnetic fields. Could also be the direction of a wave, the wave vector that points in the direction of the wave. And the magnitude of a wave vector is two pi over wavelength. So it's actually conveying wavelength. We will talk more about doing math with vectors in following videos, but right here, I wanna talk about two of the most common things that we will need to do with vectors to do calculations. So we'll start with a 3D vector. So here's our vector notation. We write it as A with a little arrow over top. That's to remind us that A is actually a vector quantity. And in Cartesian coordinates, it would point a certain distance along X, point a certain distance along Y, and also point a certain distance along Z. This X with the hat over it, that is a unit vector in the direction of the X axis. And it's a unit vector, meaning the amplitude is one. So we use unit vectors when we only care about direction and we don't want its magnitude to pollute our calculations. And so for in this case, we don't want the magnitude of this to change the magnitude along X because we want the distance along X to be purely A sub X. And we can make the same argument about the Y direction and the Z direction. So X hat, Y hat, and Z hat are unit vectors. And that makes AX, AY, and AZ purely the distance along each of those. And if we bring these all together, we have a composite vector.
we may want to calculate the magnitude of that vector. So it's really Pythagorean theorem. And the magnitude of A is the square root of the sum of all of the components of that vector squared. So AX squared plus AY squared plus AZ squared. We add all those together, take the square root. That's the magnitude of the vector. We may want a unit vector in the direction of A. And when we're doing this, we probably want a unit vector because we want just the direction of A and we don't want its magnitude to necessarily affect the value we get from a calculation where we're using it. So to calculate the unit vector A, the hat or the caret above it means that that is a unit vector. We take the actual vector A and divide that by its magnitude. And now we have a unit vector in the direction of A.